a former member of the MIT Blackjack team, the inspiration for the best-selling book Bringing Down the House and the Movie 21, a consultant to the 49ers and Portland Trail Blazers, a founder of multiple companies, a published author. Our next speaker holds a unique insight into the power of numbers, data, and analytics. Please welcome Jeff Ma, Senior Vice President of Product and Analytics at Duetto. The uh, last speaking slot is a very, very, very cherished spot. Everybody wants it because, you know, you always want to be in the way of people getting a booze. All right. How many of you guys have seen 21 or read the book, Bringing Down the House? So you'll know what I like to call Hollywood magic, and I mean true Hollywood magic is how you turn an average-looking Asian-American male into a dashing British white guy, which is what they did in the movie. It was in 2001, a friend of mine by the name of Ben Mesrick had written uh, six books, but it's fair to say that his career wasn't going anywhere as a writer. I went up to him and I said, Ben, I have this great idea for your next book. And he says, well, what is it? And I said, well, me and my buddies from MIT, we use math to beat the casinos. And he said, okay, you know, I don't think anyone wants to read about a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. And then a couple weeks later, we took him with us to Vegas, and he said, oh my God, this is the coolest thing. We should write a book about this. I said, oh, that's a great idea, Ben. So then we approached his publisher. We said, hey, we've got a great idea for Ben's next book. She says, what is it? We told her. She said, no one wants to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. Well, we didn't listen to her. We wrote a book called Bring Down the House. It was the New York Times bestseller for over a year. And then eventually got turned into a movie called 21, which was number one in the box office for two weeks and made $150 million off a $35 million budget. So in the end, people did want to see a movie and read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. So what was cool is the nerds won. And as you can see from all this talk about AI and data science and machine learning at this conference, I'd say the nerds are continuing to win. So, I'm going to take you guys through a little journey. So as I mentioned, I just started at a company called Duetto, which is an incredible company in the revenue management space for hotels, basically taking analytics and data science to the hotel world and helping hotels become more profitable. But I'm going to take you through a little journey of what I did in the world of Blackjack and what brought me into this world of hospitality and hotel tech. So I'm going to tell you my formative story, the story that really shaped me as a human being. I was 21 years old. I had just used this mathematical system to beat the casinos. This is big data before there was ever such a term. And every decision we make at the blackjack table is governed by probability. It's governed by analytics. So I sit down at the table, and I bet two hands of $10,000. The dealer gives me a pair of nines, and uh, it's showing a five, and, and I have an 11. The pair of nines against a five, for those of you guys that play blackjack, what do I do there? I need to split them. This is not a big blackjack crowd, or either that or it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So I put another $10,000 down. The dealer gives me a 2 to make 11. Then what do I have to do? I have to double down, which means I put another $10,000 down. The dealer gives me an 8 to make 19. The 9 against a 5, I hit. I get a jack to make 19. And then the 11 against a 5 is another hand that I want to double down. So I do. I double that down, and I get a 8 to make 19. So I have 19, 19, 19 against the dealer's five. How much money do I have on the table? $50,000. You guys are a really quiet crowd. I spoke to the National Accountants Association, and I said, how much money do I have on the table? And they were like, I don't know, like $30,000? And they're like, no wonder we're in a deficit right now as a country. OK, so I have $50,000 on the table. The dealer flips a 6 to make 11 and then gets a king to make 21. I lose $50,000. This woman behind me shrieks, oh my god, that's my entire mortgage. And I turn around and go, where do you live? Because where I live in San Francisco, that's a cardboard box in the tenderloin. So I had just lost $50,000, which is very difficult as a 21-year-old. And now the math calls for me to bet another three hands of $10,000. So this is one of those moments in times you wonder how I got there. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about being data-driven, OK? Learning to be data-driven came from this whole blackjack world. And obviously, I'll get to the conclusion of that story later. But I want to talk about the basics of blackjack. So this wonderful matrix you see up here shows you what to do at every hand of the blackjack table. And on the left side, you can see the player's hand. And on the top side is the dealer's card. And if you just learn to pay basic strategy perfectly, you go from losing about 3% of the money you put on the table to only losing about half a percent of the money just by following this. 
But a lot of people don't follow basic strategy and it actually really illustrates why as human beings we are terrible at making decisions. Because we are so emotional when we make decisions. There's something called omission bias. Okay, where let's say you have 15 and the dealer has a 10 showing, all right? What should you do in that hand, do you think? You should hit. There you go, we got a blackjack player finally. You should hit, which means you should take a card. If you get seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, you lose right away. So a lot of people don't want to hit in that situation. A lot of people will just kind of hope that the dealer flips a card and has to take a card, and well, if they beat you, at least you weren't the cause of your own demise. And that's favoring inaction over action. That is a really bad cognitive bias. Another one is the idea of the gut feeling. I always talk about who's the most dangerous human being in the world, Malcolm Gladwell because he can write these unbelievable stories and convince you they're true, but the idea that you can blink and make better decisions is not true. I guarantee you, if we go play blackjack and I use basic strategy and I'm data-driven, I will win more than you do. So this idea of there being a gut feeling, and you know, data informs all decisions, and people talk about being data-driven, I even just talk about being data-informed, which means you need data to make decisions, and that's at the core of the value proposition that, that my company, Duetto, provides to hoteliers. So finally, there's something that's very interesting in being data-driven. Let's say that I have 15 and the dealer has a 10 showing, okay? If we're sitting around at one of the casinos, we go to Vegas tonight, we decide, you know, we, after this happy hour, we decide it's a good idea for all to go to Vegas, and we're sitting at the Cosmo Hotel, and I'm standing behind you because they won't let me play blackjack there, and you say, hey, Jeff, I have 15, the dealer has a 10, what am I supposed to do here? And I say, you're supposed to hit. If you get six to make 21 and win, I'm a genius. If you get seven to make 22 and lose, I'm a, nev I'm a moron that they never should have made a movie or a book about. But in both cases, that decision was 100% correct. One, you just suffered a poor outcome and one you didn't. So separating the decision from the outcome is very important as you think through how to make better decisions. So again, why are we bad at making decisions? Well, there I am, in case you guys didn't know, I was in the movie. I play a dealer named Jeffrey. The guy that plays me, Jim Sturgis, walks up to me. We have a witty back. This is not ringing any bells to you guys at all. It's, I'm serious. It's a great scene. I have three talking lines. I have a SAG card. If you guys want to go back and watch it, it's at about 59 minutes and three seconds. <laughs> so this wonderful scene that none of you guys remember took three days to film. And I have this up there kind of as a joke, but always as a, a reminder of one of, the worst, one of the most difficult decisions I ever had to make in my life. So those of you guys that play blackjack, have you ever split tens? Raise your hand if you split tens. Wow. Now all the gamblers are coming out. So you should never split tens unless you're counting cards. But, I, but counting cards is the knowledge of how many face cards and aces remain versus low cards. And if you have a pair of tens and the dealer has a six showing, and you know that almost every card that you haven't seen is a face card or an ace, then you should split those tens. And it's something that you learn as you get further in the blackjack world. So I had just learned this. I walked into the MGM Grand, and I bet, bet two hands of $8,000. On the first one, I got a blackjack. On the second one, I got a pair of tens, and the dealer had a six showing. And as I'm looking at the cards on the table, I realize, holy crap, this is a hand that I should split these tens. But I don't really want to. And I don't know why I don't want to. And as I look around the table, I realize that the reason I don't want to is because everyone at the table is going to be incredibly mad at me if I split these tens. But they don't have the innovation, the data, the knowledge that I have, right? They're just going blind. If I could sit down with them and explain it to them, maybe they'd be okay with me splitting these tens. So what's happening there? I'm falling for something called groupthink, where I'm making a decision to avoid conflict. And you see this in business. You see this in business like hospitality, where all of a sudden you have technology, data, that is now available to you, and you're going to make very different decisions than you used to make, right? Then I go, okay, fine, I can't fall for this groupthink, but I still don't want to split these tens. And I realize at the core, it's because I have a 20 and the dealer has a six, which is a winner. So what's happening there? I am being averse to losing. I am favoring or I'm scared of loss more than I am winning. And this is, again, another cognitive bias that you see in a lot of different places. And I'm sure you see in the hotel industry where people are, you know, like sunk cost, all that kind of stuff. It causes us to make bad decisions. When you think about that pair of tens, 
I should be trying to grow wealth as much as I can. I should not be worried about protecting wealth. Okay, so the dealer flips. I go, fine, we'll split these tens, put another $10,000 down. The dealer, sorry, an $8,000 down. The dealer flips, uh, gives me an ace on the first one, gives me a nine on the second one, right? It's great. The dealer flips uh, 10 to make 16, and then gets another 10 to make 26. So I win another $16,000 get up from the table because the shoe's over, and pretty much everyone at the table now wants to kill me and take all my money and walk away. But the decision to make those difficult decisions is overcoming all of these very difficult cognitive biases. So how did I get here? Well, I graduated from MIT with a mechanical engineering degree that I've never used in my life. Makes my parents very happy that they spent all that money on my education. And then the whole internet thing happened, and I went back and I started a couple of internet companies in Boston. I sold one to Richard Branson at Virgin. I sold another to Yahoo. And then most recently, I sold a company to Twitter. And this whole Moneyball movement that came around made me very interested in what were the other opportunities? What were the other industries that I could be involved in? And for me, I was always like really enamored with hospitality. I love staying in nice hotels. I, always looked at the pricing, it didn't quite make sense, and I was like, and I looked at all the different things that hotels could do around personalization and bundling, and I was like, man, that would be a great place to, to, to start working. So I looked into hospitality, and as I looked at that, I always look at this sort of pyramid, and this is this pyramid that I think about, which is success by being data-driven. And at the bottom of this pyramid, as dumb as it sounds, as absolutely elementary as it sounds, is data, data. You need data to have a data-driven solution. And the company that I'm working with, Duetto, it's data at the core. It, you know, this data has been trapped in different difficult systems. It's not in the cloud, but all of a sudden now it's being unlocked. Analysis, right? Great data scientists, great machine learning, all that kind of stuff that we've talked about. Now that's available. And then finally, implementation, the willingness of hoteliers and revenue managers to actually start implementing this information. And I said, God, this is a great opportunity. So why data-driven hospitality? One, untapped, untapped opportunities. So like I said, collecting all this data, putting it in the cloud, gives us the opportunity to all of a sudden start analyzing all of this great data from all of our customers to understand. So how many times have revenue managers or hoteliers had these great theories about pricing. Like we talked to one of our customers and he was talking about how he doesn't think they yield enough on their most important days. And he said, I think that 80% of our revenue comes from 20% of our days and those 20% of days we need to yield more. And as he was saying this, I was like, okay, take a few notes, go back, talk to my data scientist, we go through it. And he wasn't quite right, but we were able to identify a bunch of different markets where that is the case and where maybe we need to be a bit more aggressive on yielding. And then this idea of cognitive biases, they're in all of us, but because of them, they allow us to create advantage if we can unlock or we can get away from the cognitive biases. So the idea of you know, groupthink or whatever in the revenue management space, but also just this idea of, of optimizing profit or optimizing revenue Right now, revenue managers, if they sell out their hotels, they'll probably be okay in their job. But what happens if they aggress too aggressively price things too low? Well, who knows? So creating the right incentives, aligned incentives, uh, will keep you away from the classic sort of principal agent problem, right? Everyone has aligned incentives. And then finally, just like Blackjack, it's a classic analytics problem. If I have a thousand ho room hotel, every night I have a thousand opportunities to, to gain a small edge. And every hotel should be out there trying to gain that small edge, right? Because you can do it and you need to do it. And so it's a classic analytics problem. So I know you guys are all like, oh my God, what happened to him? I want to hear the end of that story. Well, I kept playing, of course. And I played. Uh, Another three hands at $10,000. And the first one, I got a nine. The second one, I get a 19. Third one, I get an ace four. The dealer has a six. So I double the nine against the six. And I get a queen on that to make 19. The 19 against the six is a hand I stand. Ace four against the six is a hand I double down again. So I do, I get a four on that to make 19. So I have 19, 19, 19 against the dealer six. 
Here's my chance to win back everything I just lost or to lose two of those women's houses. And the only reason that I'm in this situation is because I fundamentally believe in data and being data-driven, all right? So the dealer flips a king to make 16 and then gets a five to make 21. So I lose another $50,000. I am crushed. I go up to my room at Caesar's Palace. I collapse on the floor, stare up at the ceiling, wonder to myself, why is there a mirror up there? But <laughs> I'm 21 years old, I don't know. But I went through a complete crisis of faith at that moment. And without getting into all the details, my decision ended up being to keep playing. And I did, and I went down and I kept playing, and over the next couple days, I won back that $100,000, and finally, the last day there, I, was won I won $70,000. So I walked away up. And again, like, if there's anything that you guys need to think about that hopefully makes you feel like data-driven, being data-driven is the right way to do it, and also being completely stubborn to stick with the process, that's the right way to do it. And hopefully that's the message I can leave with you guys. So thank you.